Hello, my name is Sarah Backley. I'm Associate Director at the British Chamber of Commerce in Japan. 2021 is the start of a new and very exciting year for the Chamber and more importantly for UK-Japan relations. Um, our team at the Chamber, although remotely, we're currently planning our entire events calendar for 2021. Um, I mean, as you know, there's been so much going on in the world at the moment and with the uncertainties that remain, planning anything can seem almost impossible. But we're all in the same boat, we all have to plan and budget. So with this, I thought today we might um, hear from our two key partners, British Council and British Embassy Tokyo, on just what's on the agenda for them this year. Um, today we'll be hearing from British Council Director for Japan, Matt Knowles, and Head of Trade and Investment at British Embassy Tokyo, Chris Heffer. Um, we'll be hearing from them on some of the big things to come in 2021 uh, to really just set the agenda for the year to come and just to see how chamber members and businesses can get involved. Uh, given the current circumstances, plans are of course subject to change, but let's see if we can get some ideas of what may happen um, and what we for now can keep an eye on and look forward to in 2021. Joining me today is fellow Chamber team member, Graham Davis, Senior Advisor at the BCCJ. Um, I'll pass over to you first, Graham. Uh, you can start with any questions that you may have for either Matt or Chris. Thanks, Sarah, and hello, everybody. Uh, as Sarah said, right at the beginning of the year, um, this is less about forecasting and more about agenda setting and thinking about uh, what people have got in their, their diaries and uh, how uh, they're planning the year ahead. So let me start with uh, Chris Heffer. Um, mm. And Chris, really, the end of last year uh, was dominated by the uh, UK-Japan Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, Agreement, which I think came into effect on the 1st of January this year. So it got the year off to a good start. Mm -hmm. um, where are we with that? What happens now? Um, and what kind of effects can we see happening under the SEPA in 2021? Uh, thanks, Graham. Thanks, Sarah. And hi, everybody. Um, so as you said, the big one for UK, Japan uh, was indeed the SEPA, which uh, our Secretary Liz Truss was here to sign uh, October 23rd and came in pretty rapidly, just uh, I think six weeks later on the 1st of January. Clearly, large parts of that carry forward the earlier EU agreement, but there's some quite nice uh, differences uh, on the UK side. Um, and it kind of had three blocks in my mind. I can say a bit more in detail if you like, but one around uh, liberalising our agricultural markets, in particular tariff reductions. Um, a whole series of rules underpinning sort of modern trade from financial services to digital. And actually some good things, including for members here on business mobility, the ability to come and go between the UK and Japan, brackets COVID notwithstanding. So as you say, it's been implemented. Um, and in this way, our work, both as government and businesses, uh, starts now. Uh, one, to try and promote the, de the deal in enough details of businesses and understand it, absorb it. And I think our key message is, have a plan for Japan. Some of those tariff reductions take time, so it may, now may not be the moment, but have a plan for Japan. We also set up all the committee structures that go alongside implementing and uh, following up any kind of government-to-government -government de uh, deal. And there's a variety of areas that both cover, some of which are interested to businesses and members. And then we monitor, has it had success, both in growing exports, which is, which is one of the key goals, but also are people using the provisions in it? So that's pretty much what we're focused on, on now, Graham. And in particular, we're trying to focus on March as a key month for bringing uh, our activity together and really uh, kicking the year off with a good start. Um, I guess one of the big things that might excite members from a personal uh, perspective here in Japan is uh, access around the SEPA on food and drink. Uh, we have agreed seven what's called geographical indicators for famous British products, including Scottish salmon, uh, West Country cheddar cheese, uh, blue Stilton cheese and Scotch whiskey, except, except no substitutes. But room to negotiate another 70, including maybe Cornish pasties, uh, new market sausages, or the Cornish clotted cream. Uh, in case you see any uh, rivals to visit this market. Um, we also see the prices of some favourite British foods should be coming down as well. So beef goes down from a 38% tariff now to zero. Not that quickly, 2033, so take your time. Bacon should go from 8% to zero. 
uh, blue cheese and cheddar cheese from 29.8% to zero by 2033, and black tea down 12% by 2023. So hopefully you might see more of your favorite British products at a slightly more uh, reasonable price coming soon. So what, what happens in March? How, how do you take it forward from, from um, March? So, so this is very much putting our promotion hats on and saying, let's engage UK business uh, in the deal. It's a pretty busy month already, but we're, we're putting a few more activities in there and really trying to build a sense of momentum around March. So we'll try and do a kickoff event with our partner and indeed your partner uh, as BCCJ with Export to Japan, uh, targeting a large range of UK businesses. We then have a whole series of building around existing events uh, here in the Japan market. So there's an offshore wind expo in early in March, a growing area in Japan and important for COP. Uh, we have a, the food ex, yet to hear if that is virtual or hybrid, but that happens in early March. We have an innovation leader summit with a whole variety of fintech firms coming. And we'll be supplanting that with webinars on educational opportunities, which I know Matt's involved with, uh, with fintech, um, uh, and with a range of other areas as well, possibly on cyber security. So really trying to make the most um, of that month to amplify our activities. And you mentioned offshore wind, foodex, uh, fintech. Um, you know, does that give us a, a scope, the, the range of areas that you're particularly focused on within SEPA and, and outside? Um, it does. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty good list. And those are our, I mean, Japan is a large economy. The UK is a large economy. Uh, we have collective interest uh, in all sorts of areas. Um, digital is clearly the underpinning of, of modern societies. Um, and I would pick out cybersecurity, which I mentioned as a growing area uh, here in Japan. Uh, one that you and BCCJ also know the importance of uh, quite recently. Um, and we've done uh, webinars on the auto industry, so cybersecurity in the auto industry, and looking to do one on cybersecurity in the rail industries. So actually going quite niche uh, is quite helpful. I guess slightly outside SEPA, we are doing a bunch of work on defense collaboration and looking at, do we build a future combat aircraft with Japan, which is a pretty huge uh, strategic um, and momentous decision uh, and not an easy one, both from a political level or indeed to systems collaborating. So that's kind of taking it step by step. Um, and we're doing a lot of work on nuclear decommissioning. Again, some of those happen a little bit outside the SEPA, but it's our focus here at the embassy. So we've got a range of mega projects like the defence project, but then mm. also you seem to be supporting a lot of uh, potentially small businesses coming to Japan for the first mm. time. How, how, do, how do you go about encouraging them, getting, the, getting momentum uh, or building momentum, particularly when people can't actually travel so much? Yeah, the, the last point is quite, it's quite a kicker, Graham. So uh, not, easy, not easy to do. Um, so uh, at one point, as you say, this, this deal has benefits for existing companies, such as your members, uh, the Rolls Royces, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, AstraZeneca's of the world who are here, who can look at some of the provisions around data localization, around use of IP, maximize benefits to existing businesses. But we have around, I think, eight or 9,000 companies that currently expa export to Japan. We'd love that to grow by about 20%. And so how can we encourage new SMEs to come? Um, some of those could be the consumer side. So there's lots of tariff reductions on food and drink. Uh, I can whet your appetite around uh, geographical indicators on a wide range of famous British products um, in a moment. Um, and we're reaching out across the UK, both with export to Japan digitally, but also what's called, we have trade advisors across the whole country uh, in Britain, and they are going around also promoting this deal. To be honest, Graham, what's giving us a bit of a headache is the renewed uptick of excitement in Japan at the very moment where people can't get on a plane. And so they're like, how do I join your trade mission? How can I come? So I think we have a plan for Japan it appears to be the right thing to think at this moment. Um, Japan does take a bit of work, as many of you will know, and actually doing your research beforehand probably benefits any trip that you do do. But you do feel as though there is genuine interest, renewed interest and in vigouring you know, the UK exports to Japan. Uh, I think there is. I mean, Japan has proved a pretty resilient market. Uh, our exports have grown, I'm going to say, 35 40% over the last five years. A lot of that on the services side. A lot of that with businesses that, that members here uh, conduct, um, and thank you to them. We continue to change lots of things, which is always good professional services. They like uh, change of agreements. And we mentioned that EU-CEPA, there's also CPTPP, and indeed a UK-EU deal, which is no like keeping members uh, across the board uh, fairly busy. So I, I think the range of things for us, to, for us to work on and really kind of grow the appetite. And then I think the SEPA does open new markets. And now is a good time if you haven't thought about Japan to come and have a look.
Okay. I have one more thing which I'm going to plug, which is uh, slightly more in Matt's world. We are pioneering on Did Things Digital, just as you at the Chamber are doing as well. And we have our first ever virtual trade exhibition uh, on the 5th of February around smart manufacturing. And it will literally look like a trade fair that you wander into with a lobby and you turn left and you turn right. And you can go and visit 25 amazing British companies. And we're hoping to get over 500 Japanese visitors through the virtual door. And we've done research with big Japanese companies saying, what do they want? And we've selected the companies uh, around, around that. So we're pioneering stuff around virtual trade fairs. And we'll let you know how it goes. But uh, please do check it out. Okay. And just... We talked about CEPA and off CEPA a little bit. The other thing is the comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, or as we all know it, CPTPP. Are we approaching that? What, what's happening there? So I think the UK has made pretty clear its desire to join. Um, uh, cross your fingers, depending on when this uh, has gone out, uh, we may have news for you as to that application uh, going in. Um, this is the part of the world to be in the trade deal terms for British side, like buses. Now you wait a while and they all come along and Britain's doing fine at the moment and four are in this part of the world. So Japan done, Australia, New Zealand separately in negotiation, CPTPP and the USA. So uh, Britain is keen to look to the Asia Pacific and the Indo-Pacific uh, region for future growth and future compatibility. Um, and CPTPP is a great uh, sort of ready to go deal um, that I think we're really keen to join for trade reasons, uh, for diversity of supply. It gives us access to new markets that the UK might uh, wish to, uh, and for strategic reasons. And I guess it's important for us in Japan because Japan has the chair this year. So Japan is actually setting the rules and determining how the existing CPTPP members think about a new country such as Britain uh, applying and joining. So there's quite a lot of work to do here in Japan, um, and I welcome the support of your members in that too. And with a fair wind, what kind of time scale are you thinking of in terms of application and approvals, etc.? How long does it take? So, I think your last question is very different from your first question. I mean, normally trade agreements take seven years, as you right. might well know, uh, and they consist of physical comings and goings and a week here and a week there. Uh, we have done the Japan FDA deal. We started in June and we finished in October. And we implemented six weeks later. Um, that's caused us all some angst, if I'm, if I'm honest, Graham, about that speed. And I don't think that pace will let up. And actually, digital has changed the way we've done it. And I don't think we will go back. And I'm sure that's true across a wide range of areas for you and the council as well. So we are learning new methods. Um, it's on both sides, isn't it? I mean, the, 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 it was unusual for our side to be able to move so quickly, but equally unusual and frankly unexpected for the Japanese side to be able to move so quickly um, it is, and it is, and, and I mean, we were building on existing EU deal to some extent, so that does give you a framework for, for, for starting from. Um, and there was a deadline that mattered, particularly on the Japanese side, actually. So that one was doable in that time frame because you, if you want to get a deal done, you can. Um, I'm not sure our Secretary has publicly said when CPTPP timing is. I know she's pretty ambitious, so I'd imagine it's ASAP. And I think we are working closely with Japan to try and uh, do as much as we can during their chair. Okay. Like that, like that. And, and last question for me to turn it mm. round actually and, and look at business the other way. Um, we have a lot of uh, people, uh, overseas members in the UK who support Japanese business going into the UK. I know um, that's a little bit about of, of, what, mm. of what you do and the embassy has responsibility for that. What are your expectations there and what's the mood of Japanese business in the UK at the moment? Uh, uh I guess a couple of things, and we talked about the SEPA, which clearly liberalises bilateral trade, and actually, if you look at the detail, it's public, um, it increases massively Japanese exports to the UK, actually rather more than the other way around, about £12 million of increase. Um, a lot of that actually is automotive vehicles, and the EU took the tariff down, um, and I think that does give Japan a real area to focus on, and indeed car parts, which is critical to it, the car manufacturing industry in the UK as well. Uh, you might have noticed uh, exciting things on Twitter if you're a UK citizen around cheaper soy sauce. Uh, and you can now buy shochu in the UK in 900 millimeter bottles, which was previously not legally a uh, measure in the UK. So uh, there were certain things that Japan was very keen to prioritize in this deal, which will benefit a certain select group perhaps uh, back in the UK. Um, I guess we've also seen on Christmas Eve uh, an EU UK uh, so called Brexit deal done. 
Um, I think in Japan that's been really welcome, probably both for the fact that it was a deal and it removes the uncertainty that a new deal might have caused. Um, and I think there were some good provisions in there, particularly for the auto industry. And there is a real challenge and opportunity for them. Um, there's some quite technical stuff around rules of origin for electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles and a six year window effectively to localize in the UK a lot more of that content to continue to access the preferential tariffs the agreement gives. So it, it gives a real pathway and a roadmap for that industry that we're keen to work on uh, with big investors here. And they've been privately and publicly very welcoming of that deal as well. Okay, um, I'll go back to uh, Sarah now. Th thanks very much, Chris. Matt, going back to the topic of digitalization, as I think Chris put it, pioneering in all things digital. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's, it's impacted the way that the British Council um, has operated this past year. But what about for the, for the coming year? Do you think uh, the move to digital and everything that you've achieved virtually will, will continue post COVID? Do you think there's anything that's worthwhile there for, I guess, the operations of the British Council moving forward long term? Yeah, it absolutely will do. Uh, I guess there's two two very different sides of our work to to mention here. We are specialists in the English language. Uh, we're we're involved in every aspect of the English language system, from teacher training and teaching to the development of curricular materials to the assessment of English. And there's been huge change um, in the in the context of COVID for us in the way that we deliver teacher training and teaching and assessment. Mm -hmm. and those innovations will stay with us. In, in the past, if you wanted to learn with the British Council, you probably needed to get yourself to Idabashi, but our team of 50 teachers now can, can offer you a class wherever you are in Japan. So that's a, that's, that's a big breakthrough. Um, also, in the world of assessment, um, we were piloting an online version of the IELTS test last year that you could take at home to see if, if that type of innovation stays with us. No, normally there's extraordinary traffic between the two countries on so many levels, not least in the education and, and cultural sectors. Um, I think it's been very interesting to see the ways in which the UK's cultural institutions have engaged with audiences during lockdown. And that's been very innovative and, and I, I really expect those innovations will stay with us. So the London Symphony Orchestra, a good example, they were meant to come and perform a series of concerts in Japan. They weren't able to come, obviously. So they went into um, uh, one, of, one of their recording venues in London called St. Luke's and they recorded a special performance for Japan of one of, one of the pieces that they had planned to perform. I think it's an interesting example um, similarly, the National Gallery, the curator came out to the Museum of Western Art for the opening. She would have delivered a lecture. Maybe there would have been a few hundred people in the auditorium to hear it. Um, as the lockdown fell, actually, we walked around the exhibition with her and recorded a virtual tour. 120,000 people have seen it. So I think the, the, way, the way in which institutions have have reached a wider audience in the context of the restrictions has been has been really interesting and I think those innovations will stay with us. Absolutely and that's something that can be carried you know across industries not just in the cultural um, field. So Matt 2021 a lot of key happenings in the UK Japan agenda. Um, G7, COP15, COP26, COP15 not to be forgotten, COP6, COP26, hopefully the Olympics, Paralympics. What are the British Council's expectations? Do you have any you know, campaigns or any events planned around uh, these, these key events that are scheduled? Yes, I mean, I think the expectation is that we'll need to be nimble and agile and flexible and that uncertainty will prevail for a considerable uh, amount, of, amount of time this year. Uh, starting with COP26, we support university collaboration between the UK and Japan. And um, there's a long-standing university consortium called Renke. It's made up of six UK universities and six Japanese universities. 
And as we approach COP26, we are commissioning some, some new UK Japan research that will be looking at energy transition and growth in the region. So hopefully we'll be able to bring um, some initial findings from that research to, to the event in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. and those universities are also comparing notes on the climate commitments that they've made, the targets they've set themselves. So lots of interesting collaboration in the higher education sector. I'm sure the members have come across the UK and Japan campaign, uh, originally conceived as a campaign from the Rugby World Cup to the end of the Paralympics, and that's been extended. But in the cultural sector, our ambition has been to have a, a special cultural treat every month from the UK. And we look back on some fantastic exhibitions and performances from uh, London Philharmonia, from the BBC Proms, from National Gallery, National Portrait Gallery. Um, that, that campaign continues. And we look forward in February to an exhibition in Tokyo from the Tate, an exhibition of, of Constable's painting. And, and further ahead too, I think if members come onto the British Council site, you'll see, the, you'll see those, those cultural treats in the calendar. Actually, our ambition through the campaign was to create 100 new partnerships and um, through those partnerships to be sharing experience and um, de deepening our, our understanding of, of one another. So is it through the, the British Council website that members can firstly find out and hopefully get involved with uh, the campaign? Yes, there's a dedicated site for the UK and Japan campaign and the, the event information is there. In, in, increasingly, um, there are digital events that people can enjoy or, or attend. Okay, great. Um, Graham, I'll pass back to you. Thanks. And well, I'm going to ask Chris uh, uh, the same question. I mean, uh, G7, COP15, COP26 uh, and the Olympics, any one of those would be a full year's work, Chris. You've got all four. <laughs> uh, how, what are your plans, expectations and, and how do you manage all of that? Uh, yes, thank you, Graham. Good challenge and very much one that we're looking at in January 2021. Uh, I guess my, my slightly flip comment, if I can be personal for a moment, is I do finish here in August. So I wish my successor well in the, in the latter half of those. Um, I'm hoping to at least see the Olympics out, uh, which I think will be quite an enormous moment if it happens. Uh, I guess at this moment we don't know. And I know being in London 2012, that was quite a transformative moment for the UK and London on the global stage, a chance to say, who are you as a country in the 21st century and how do you explain that to the world? I think the opportunity is there for Japan in a very different context, but I think it's quite an exciting one to do. So I'm, I'm quite looking forward to that. Um, G7, as you say, which the UK is hosting uh, shortly, quite a big one, it'll be Suga's first time on the international stage. A new US president uh, with some policies, uh, which we should look forward to discussing at the G7. Um, and also the UK has invited uh, three other countries to observe and participate, Australia, Korea and India, uh, forming a so-called D10 or Democratic 10. Again, all countries in this part of the world. And so as the UK looks to expand uh, its alliances um, and working with like-minded countries across the world, um, the G7 stroke D10 is quite an interesting moment uh, for this part of the world as well. Uh, Olympics, I think uh, Matt has covered. It's a, it's a global moment usually. Uh, I think we wait to see. Um, the Paralympics in particular was hugely transformative in the UK with the vision of disability in society, um, seeing elite sport, properly elite sport happen in a way people perhaps didn't think it would happen. Um, and also uh, pioneering things like the last leg, the use of kind of comedy to unpick stereotypes. And again, I think we are keen to work with Japan on a, on a wide variety of areas. Um, you, you've missed a few others, which you can be forgiven for. So we're looking at then COP, which you covered in, in December. Uh, we are expecting a new ambassador. Um, I don't think it's ambassadress, but I think it's, uh, so we look forward to Julia coming, uh, will be the first female British ambassador to Japan um, and, and all the uh, entry requirements, sorry, um, and all the things that she does just to settle into her role. I know that coming to see BCC members as well. Uh, again, I don't know anything, but it has been nearly four years since the Prime Minister last visited Japan. Um, uh, and the Olympics is a possible time, but there are other moments uh, when that could happen as well. So um, I think it could be an even busier year than even those big set piece moments uh, on the UK stage. 
just to drill down perhaps into um, COP26, because I mean, G7 is obviously a huge political event and immensely time consuming, a lot of uh, very important things. COP, though, need, really needs to involve business a lot more if it's going to make progress in uh, implementing uh, you know, the climate change um, policies. So do you think that there's going to be a lot of more you know, sort of business involvement at COP26? Are you going to be taking Japanese business over, uh, trying to get them working with British business on creating solutions to these problems? Mm -hmm. So you're quite right, Graham, at so many levels that business engagement is critical to the delivery of government goals. I think also we've seen this in Japan, it's been the push more ambitious government goals. Um, in the paper the other day with Sony and Sunter and others urging Prime Minister Suga to go further here in Japan. Clearly from a British government side as the host of COP we are keen for the most ambitious pledges to, to tackle uh, climate change. We have committed the first one to do so to legislate in law to net zero by 2050 uh, and keen to see others having followed that but also follow that with detailed plans. So I think, yes, we're keen for businesses to, to push and cajole governments to rise to challenge. I think Britain has also pioneered the use of commercial instruments and use of markets to deliver some of those. We've taken the offshore wind feed-in tariffs down and down to prices we didn't dream perhaps we could achieve uh, in the early years. Um, and as Japan in particular opens up its markets to competition, it's learning very closely from the UK from a government side. And many of its big trading houses have been instrumental to offshore wind in the UK and now bringing that back to Japan with British expertise. So at a number of levels, that's absolutely true. Um, we are encouraging businesses here and around the world to sign up to net zero pledges, uh, the race to zero, uh, keen to do that. We are, should be holding a gr global green investment uh, summit for business, I think just before uh, COP itself, and we'll be keen to send a wide range of invitations to, to Japanese companies. So. I think business again is both the deliverer uh, and the spur to, to achieve our goals, Graham. Okay, thank you. Sarah, back to you. Matt, you wear many hats, um, one of which is higher education, as you mentioned. And when it comes to higher education, I know you always have a full agenda and calendar ahead. Um, and you mentioned the, the, uh, the move to online and more accessible teaching and learning. What would you say are the main, the main opportunities for, for students in the UK interested in Japan or vice versa? Yeah, well, it's very hard to know when the restrictions will be, will be lifted. Mm -hmm. um, and one announcement that's been made in the last few months is, is around the future of the Erasmus Plus scheme. So um, in the past for UK students there, there was access to uh, a huge mobility scheme um, it's been terrifically successful through the years and many have benefited from that what we've what we've very recently heard about is a a new scheme called the Turing scheme which is going to be run by the UK and there's been an announcement that it will be supported with 100 million pounds of funding and with an initial target of creating an opportunity for 35,000 young people to study overseas or um, complete some kind of work experience or internship overseas and it will be it'll be a global program so we're waiting for the details but I think your your question um, comes back to me for something Chris was talking about as we as we look to fully animate this trade deal and take advantage of it and um, position the UK in the long-term future as a, as a close uh, trading partner for Japan. I think that the, there's a really important question for, for us in, in two areas. Firstly, how do we increase the number of young people learning English in Japan yeah. um, to the point that they can confidently speak English and conduct business in English? And similarly, in the UK, how do we massively up uh, upscale the number of young people learning Japanese because language language is crucial in 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 in, in doing business in the long -term future of the trading relationship. And similarly, um, how do we create more opportunities for for students to come and spend time in each other's countries? Mm -hmm. uh, talking to our ambassador yesterday, and he was reflecting that 
um, he had entered a, an essay writing competition uh, as a student that was run, I think, by the Japanese foreign ministry, and he won. And the prize was to come and spend two weeks in Japan. And it was through that short two-week experience that he he really discovered Japan and fell in love with Japan and went back and changed the focus of his study and and has had a career in which Japan has been such a central uh, pillar. And and that is the that that is the kind of short um experience or opportunity that really can change the direction of of your adult life and that's the kind of um opportunity if if well targeted and well run that can ensure we have a generation ready to do business um between between the two countries so i think as as the detail of the turing scheme becomes clear it'd be really interesting to see if there's a role for the bccj in supporting or creating those really positive short experiences for young brits to to begin their japan journey and i think if we get that kind of program right then um we we can expect the the trading relationship to really flourish which i'm sure there will be actually an appetite um amongst bccj members because i'm sure many have had quite similar experiences to the ambassador perhaps you know, a short, a short visit, some kind of insight into Japan, which has led to them, you know, moving here and doing business for their whole lives. So I think something like the Turing scheme, once, once the details are out, um, we will make sure to share that, you know, amongst members, see how we can best support an important scheme like that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Graham. Perhaps both Matt and Chris could just answer a simple question. What would you like BCCJ members to be thinking about? How can they help you? How can they get in, in, involved? Uh, and what's your message to, to BCCJ members? Um, I guess I have perhaps three messages for BCCJ members. Um, one is it's tough times on the COVID front, both from a business and a personal side. Um, and I think we're all bearing through that. So I'm going to say bear with us, but I think we're bearing with you. Uh, secondly, CEPA is full of opportunities and I need your help in delivering those. This is your businesses, your livelihoods, uh, your companies in HQ who we need to convince, uh, expand, grow and access those. So keen to be kind of co-partners uh, very much in that. And I guess the last thing in some ways, Matt, we should talk about sort of people to people schemes is let's do, perhaps let's build the foundations of a great partnership here with Japan. Um, I think we're sort of never been closer between two countries on a whole range of levels that we haven't touched on defense and security, cyber and so on. Um, but perhaps we do need to pay a little bit of attention to those fundamental people to people and working together at a human level. Um, it's something we've, we've done a while ago and perhaps we shouldn't forget in this day and age, that's quite important. Even in this digital age, there is a place for face-to-face -face communication, uh, especially here in Japan. Matt, what, what are your views? So firstly, there's lots Lots we have to offer around the English language. I think if any of the members are looking to upskill the language within their own companies, we'd be delighted to reach out and have a conversation. Uh, we've, we've got a very rare resource in Japan in terms of the expertise of 50 brilliant teachers. So uh, that, that would be a, a great area to do more on together. Secondly, in the cultural calendar I mentioned before, lots lots to enjoy the details on our website. As we approach the summer, we're hoping to bring to fruition a lot of programs looking at arts and disability. And um, this has been a, a campaign with the Paralympics in mind to ensure that the arts is accessible and to celebrate the work of disabled artists. So we have, I think, three or four major partnerships between the UK and Japan in music, uh, in theatre and in dance. That's great. Thank you both so much for your time today. And on behalf of the BCCJ, uh, I mean, we're just really looking forward to seeing what together we can achieve in 2021. Um, although, like I said at the beginning, a lot of uncertainties, plans may change, but communication is key. And there's a reason that you're our two key partners. Um, so we look forward to continue working with you. We look forward to engaging members with all of your upcoming exciting activities and events. 
and for any any upcoming news, events, activities um, from the British Council and the British Embassy Tokyo, make sure to keep a close eye on their social media, their Twitter and Facebook accounts, and also on the BCCJ e-newsletter. We'll make sure to keep you updated. Thank you.